Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. I have with me Lieutenant General Ravi Shankar, who's going to take us through the story of India's neighborhood, a clear example of what Chinese influence can actually do to you. If any country who's looking at getting into bed with China, I think all it needs to do is to look at India's neighborhood, and the clear, clearest possible picture will emerge of their future. So, although you know a lot much of the trouble within the neighborhood is also self made but china has put the oil in the fire and the probably the spice in the biryani yeah i agree with you completely our neighborhood is in a uh, i will say uh, rather a mess but that mess is not our creation or due to this thing it is all largely self created it also has a huge ingredient of the chinese hand in it um more than saying that our neighborhood is in a mess i think our neighborhood is in a transition uh internal politics internal dynamics of each of our neighbors right um is largely self driven but with a chinese hand in backdrop in it uh, about which we need to be cognizant of and we need to take do the right thing because there are opportunities coming up in this oh absolutely sir um, and the right way i think you brought it out very well that every crisis has an opportunity and india needs to look for them and act upon them i'd like to start with pakistan sir flavor of the month i think we have also had a conversation uh, with the general stock on this uh, done pretty well uh, one of the things that we see in pakistan is the new government which is coming in and as you explained last time this government is more lenient again towards uh, china having said that the damage that imran khan has caused in the past 3 to 4 years plus the history of pakistan in terms of economics and everything like that is on one side currently the situation is very 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 on a teetering edge of chaos how do you analyze the situation there sir with the events that have come out in the past couple of days look if you look at the pakistani press they feel they've gone past a crisis and that's reflected in the uh, stock market which has gone up and the dollar with you know the pakistani rupee has recovered yeah uh, but equally within their own papers there is also a view that the crisis has just been you know uh, put off for another date it was uh, while the new government is uh, you know put sworn in and a lot of bonhomie at this point of time uh how long will it last is anybody's question right the army has had to go into a huddle to repair its own image which is something that not happened before um there are already some uh, you know inklings of pressure of the new government in allotting portfolios and things like that like shabar sharif wants uh, you know bilawal bhutto to be the foreign minister there is some reluctance in that and all that so that uh, that will we'll see how it happens uh then of course the fact is that uh, imran khan has hit the streets running every day he is taking out something or the other he is putting out videos he is putting out everything and he is playing the foreign hand right so he is he is very clear he wants to go in for elections at the earliest he'll destabilize the government one way or the other okay now that his all his mlas and uh, mnas have resigned okay and they have to hold elections you know for these so there is going to be issues coming up in this uh, i mean it's not it's the, the deal is not done there <laughs> okay and then of course there is this uh, expectation that shabash sharif who is a very trans who supposed to be a very transactional man Uh, will smoothen edges with china and usa right as also russia whether he has the international capability to standing to do it is a question mark so pakistan the present crisis has uh, tided over but has the crisis run away it has not because the economy is still where it is mm. it's still in the dumps okay it's not the uh, mood at all in fact what i heard the uh, read the other day is that water scarcity is hitting pakistan badly again it's already started 
the dead level water i mean the dead uh, water level dam uh, water and dams tarbela and mangla has already been breached and we are only in april sowing season has not started nothing so if they don't have water then their cropping will go for a toss and their agriculture will go for a toss which is their mainstay of their economy right they'll have to get into a negative cycle and then will imf come about and fund them back so there is economic pain ahead and then the inflation of this uh, inflation outflow of the uh, uh, russia ukraine war is going to hit them so there are issues in all this all india can do and should do is just wait and watch let them sort out their problems i don't see any blow back into india right uh, and don't do, and let's not expect that there will be great uh, progress with india india can't invest into a big deal with this government because we don't know whether the government will last or not and the next government will honor whatever these people have done or not so we just have to uh, maintain that balance and be keep them at arms length and keep saying nice words open track to think like that and we need to use this time to concentrate elsewhere capability development and i think you've brought that out uh, multiple yeah. times on this very forum we need to do what we have to do for ourselves absolutely sir yeah so, you know i'd like you to just uh, t- although the pakistani security situation is pretty well understood uh, having said that the divide within the army itself and uh, we've had uh, you know the formation commanders conference that happened a couple of days ago the chief did not go for the swearing in of uh, the the freshest latest prime minister of pakistan uh maybe just a very very you know regular thing but in a country like pakistan where everything is analyzed and over analyzed and everything does have a meaning uh security wise the challenges are going to be multifold see uh, there are two aspects of the security in uh, pakistan one is the relationship between the political head and the military head mm-hmm. which is in, uh, which at this point of time maybe is okay because i think the military is backing uh, mr shahbaz sharif but there's the fact that this political i mean issue has touched the military is beyond doubt in this and that thing and the political facade is not absolutely cemented it's got its own cracks yeah so there are cracks in the army there are cracks in the political firmament and everything but more important in terms of problems of security is that taliban is loose they are under no one's control now so that afghanistan situation is bad the ttp is active the baluchistan people are active it's only a matter of time before the tlp starts becoming active and they'll be politically active so the security situation internal security situation in pakistan um, i don't think will improve it might even go uh, you know from back to worse i'm basing examples of that sir although yeah. pakistan can be a discussion on its own and we've had it multiple yeah will i think we have to move on uh, i'd like to move on as you said uh, to sri lanka sir i think a okay. uh, little closer in 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 position to you uh, where you sit uh yeah. sri lanka seems to be in a bit of a turmoil from a long time now so it's not something which is new the rajapaksas came in with the promise of change they brought the monks with them and politics wise they were pretty strong holding a majority today they find themselves at the receiving end of a huge huge project protest within sri lanka this apart from the huge economic problems that they face lack of trust with the imf uh chinese are not responding to them and who's basically the root cause of the entire problem so how do you see now india has provided a lot of help but still how do you see the situation see uh, sri lanka was a very stable economy and a forward looking economy say the good 8 months 10 months back suddenly due to this pandemic yeah tourism stopped tea exports uh, uh, you know went down uh the rajapaksa government want banned imports and as a result they banned fertilizers and went to organic that failed their crops failed their foodstuffs failed and uh, tourism like i said flopped completely agriculture flopped completely and they had and there was a debt driven economy right a yeah. lot of and they had put a lot of uh, 
uh, what shall I say, faith in the Chinese. And the Chinese were very transactional. They were they were prepared to you know back this Rajpaksas till such time they had something for them. Mm-hmm. The moment they found that the things were not working, Chinese have backed off. Right when things started going back bad, it, it, it has actually gone back to worse. Uh, there is a report which says maybe within a few days to a month, if things continue like this. There will be starvation deaths in uh, Sri Lanka. That's the other extreme. Well, as we all know, India has given them lines of credit for you know fuel and food and all that, and all that is expected to last to the end of this month. After the end of this month, how things will happen is to be seen, right? But two, three things have come out. One, the Sri Lankan themselves have realized that look, uh, the Chinese were not their best friends. And when the people of a nation decide that the Chinese were not their best friend, I think it's a, a you know positive development as far as we are concerned, and we need to cash in on it. There's no doubt at this point of time Sri Lanka needs help, and we need to give it to them, carte blanche, right? We don't have to give them money. We just have to ensure that they don't go from bad to worse, or they don't you know we save off their catastrophe, and help them revive. We need to help them revive and you know their economy. Uh, reviving their economy uh, also has political overtones. Uh, it depends on whether we will be able to do it or not. Politically is the issue. Political acceptance of a revival has to be is the key as far as I look at it. And if till such time this Rajpaksa government is there, I don't see that happening. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, whether this man will go or not is a matter of conjecture, or th- that family will go or not is a matter of conjecture. But if things continue in this manner, it's a matter of time. Okay. Now, politically, if something works out between India and uh, Sri Lanka, then already there are some certain movements in Tamil Nadu itself who say, "Look, let us." The Tamil Nadu government has gone to the center and said, "Tell us how we can help you." So uh, things will start improving. Now, how do you think it will happen? I mean, you have to help them export their tea. You have to pump tourism into them. You have to, you know, help revive their agriculture. I mean, uh, I shouldn't be saying it. For some time, maybe we have to treat them like another state of India and you know help it that way. You see, uh, let, let let me put it in a different context. Uh, what is happening in Sri Lanka, right? Could be happening to any one of our states which is mismanaged. But being part of a bigger nation and a bigger system with a huge currency backing and huge trade uh, interlinkages, many of our states are escaping the fate of Sri Lanka. Yeah. Sri Lanka on its own is not able to withstand it. Okay, and it. IMF will not help it too much because earlier Sri Lanka had spurned IMF and all world bodies uh, for whatever they wanted from Sri Lanka, right? In terms of devolution of power to Tamils, uh, genocide uh, allegations, inquiries, and all that, Sri Lanka was avoiding it, and they had the Chinese at that point to avoid all that. Today they don't have; they have a problem. If they have to go back to the international bodies. They will. There will be a price to pay for that. Is Sri Lanka prepared to pay that political price? Right. China has not rolled over one loan so far. They said we'll try, we'll see a lot. Of course, we have given them everything. But then still, that elephant in the room is that that is there, and already they, they Sri Lanka said we'll we are going to default on all our loans. They have already announced it yesterday. Fifty-one billion dollars default. In any case, this is not the first default. A lot of countries have defaulted. Even a country like Venezuela, which is awash with oil, has defaulted. Earlier, Argentina has defaulted. Greece has defaulted in the recent past. So this is not the first default. Lebanon has defaulted earlier. Right? It is not as if default is the end of the road. Default is the probably the beginning of the revival. Right? But definitely, Sri Lanka needs external assistance. Two ways 
two lifelines in fact three lifelines if i put it to sri lanka to revive economically one is world inst- international institutions like imf second india and third china china is obviously backed off mm. it is between india and the international institutions which have to uh, revive sri lanka and we need to do that as simple as that there is a funny commonality between these two countries one is china of course second is the isolationism that they've put themselves into and yeah uh, that uh, that is uh, look pakistan i will not say isolationism because they were quite connected with the us they're quite connected with the gulf and you know uh, russia they were having good relations but sri lanka is a different case altogether so sri lanka has not been part of the international uh, geo strategic and or geopolitical environment too much hmm. so they have only been placing their bets on either sri lanka or oh, sorry china and india and off late more on china more hmm. so now they have had, they have to do a flip and what a flip it is sir. yeah they have to they have no choice actually at this point of time absolutely uh, you know moving on to the you know the the sandwich country between india and china and this is one country that we they themselves say that we would like to be a part of the india china relationship so which is also interpreted as taking advantage of both the sides for their own gain which is fine i mean everybody every country has its own national interest and that is nepal uh they've had political crisis with kp sharma oli's government creating a lot of chaos between india and nepal relations at one time today the government is seems to be a deboa government seems to be a bit more stable there's been a you know state visit to india uh there've been interactions with the usa and again it finds itself in a tough bind because there's a lot of pressure from china here is a country which again has economic problems and a lot of other issues as well so how do you see what's happening in nepal and how what can we do see nepal has just put out that they have banned imports of non essential items yeah right they can't afford it and you know, they they are also getting into a payment crisis they are also getting into a foreign currency crisis xyz uh there is also a fact that though they've been reliant on china in the past few years and they've swung more towards china especially year before last when the lipulek pass and that area had come up and they since then the political climate in china has changed and especially because china has started you know claiming some of their northern territories so that has put the population against them right so they the population has now started becoming wary about china look i told you in the beginning of the this uh, episode you know it is the population which matters yeah if the population you know drives the system all of us that's what makes the country so the population has started realizing that they having issues with china and the government has also changed and now the government for the past one year has been quite stable and this government has consciously swung away from china and rather balancing out they were accepted aid from usa in a grant and aid scheme so oh, china oh. wangi yeah wangi came and wanted to scuttle that it's not gone through but it is going through there is also a new couple of news reports from nepali uh, media which say that there is a lot of talk about china there is a lot of uh, you know announcements made nothing moves on ground right uh, so that is also there and again if you see the natural connectivity of china, uh, nepal it is with india right and there is a lot of ethnic similarity between the, in the from the terai in the terai regions and you know a lot of uh, Uh, cultural and you know other equations which are there so they can't get away they probably at this point of time they are realizing that that it is better to be with india and plus the fact that we have helped them for uh, the coronavirus you know health wise vaccines and things like that though chinese vaccines have also been given to nepal but we all know that they don't work so everyone knows that everyone in fact that's another factor which is important in our neighborhood we live in pakistan now everyone else has got vaccines from us and they're thankful to us for that so there's a issue of uh, reliability and things like that and i think this is the time when we have to make special awards just to nepal and uh, you know uh, 
we also have a whole lot of our servicemen who are settled there they get pensions from us so we have a lot of leverage uh, in nepal which we must utilize and keep nepal firmly on our side we might not be able to swing them away from china because they have already got a lot of projects uh, chinese projects there but definitely we can regain lost ground there i think one of the things which will be very uh, interesting and very important for india's interest would be to keep the chinese military as far away as possible from you know uh, the nepalese mainland of in any way of and means of course we've got the chinese military and some of its fractions within pakistan they tried it with sri lanka but uh, nepal is something i think is going to become a bit dangerous i think you've written about it as well sir yeah I, one of the biggest problems i foresee is that some at some point of time whether in the near future or the far future uh, the chinese might force uh, nepal to allow deployment of pla in nepal right much like what nato has done with, uh, was trying to do with ukraine and russia had to. so we have to force all that i think it there it's time that we laid out red lines which we you know to nepal or the sig and those red lines should be not near our territory it should be the other side you know before pla even steps foot into any of these countries we should tell them look this is not acceptable and we start post all in that because there's no point in do getting into a situation as russia has done right at the end of the day you see if you see the russia ukraine uh, equation ukraine is their neighbor now russia whatever it has done whatever it its objectives which it achieves it has got a hostile neighbor people will be hostile ukrainians will be hostile to russia is it worth it as it is our in our neighborhood we have problems with pakistan hey right? do you need another hostile neighbor you don't and of course china is a bigger neighbor where there's a, a constant problem so do you need someone more hostile than that or new hostilities right so it is better we force all it because i have always felt that an implied threat is better than an applied threat so how do you you know keep them away is the challenge and especially with nepal and i think we need to progress on that line indeed sir so moving on towards the east which actually you know uh, is a bit more scary preposition as far as uh, india china and of course the country country in concern the mind myanmar is concerned uh, seems to be a forgotten crisis nobody talks about it anymore and that's the sad part about this entire thing uh, i think since the ukraine crisis has begun nobody's ever no, none of these uh, big powers has made a statement about uh, the crisis in myanmar um, it's it's going back to worse we hear killings we hear a whole lot of crisis india tried its hand a little bit but pulled off uh at least in the public domain how do you see the crisis in myanmar and is there something that india needs to do again you look uh, you see the history of myanmar myanmar has always been under the army rule almost throughout its existence yeah this democracy was only a small integrum experiment integrum yeah experiment call it what you want so now it's gone back to that Now people have tested democracy; they want to go back to democracy, right? So that's a fair one. That is one part of the story. But if you look at it, you know, all these years of its existence, neither has China been able to, you know, get hold of it completely, nor has India been able to get hold of it completely. There has always been an enigma about uh, right. Myanmar. No one has been able to put their influence there. The Chinese might have. done a lot of business with them but that's about all okay so if you again look at it historically the people who have had the best equations with china are uh, sorry with myanmar are uh, india is india mm. historically i mean you'll be surprised a lot of people from south india used to go to rangoon and do trade in the british times because the the sea route 
was the best from andaman nicobar and this belt used to go direct it's not the overland route so there are a lot of linkages in fact if you go to manipur there's a border town called more and more you will find all tamilians the traders are all tamilians okay, so we have we we have uh, tremendous links with them okay because so those tamilians are no more real tamilians of course uh, yeah, but the cultural links are there so from a trust point of view culture point of view they are okay with you and of course buddhism is also there right you have you are the seat of buddhism whether you like it i mean i won't say whether you like it or not whether anyone likes it or not yeah so that buddhism link is also there so there are a lot of things going before myanmar but we have had a hands off policy from myanmar and to that extent the myanmar realized that india doesn't mean anything i mean they don't want to interfere mm. we have some advantages and as per myanmar is the india border is their most peaceful border It, the thailand border is problematic the chinese border is problematic for them a lot of drug flow and all is that yeah. side not this side mm-hmm. okay so they are okay with us now the when look let's look at myanmar the problem has continued there's almost a civil war going on between the armed forces and the uh, nld right uh, which is aung, aung san suu kyi's party now they are also militarized to some extent it's not as if they are absolutely defenseless and all there there is there are pitch battles going on at places uh, massacres happening and all that and most of it you don't even know because it's remote the areas are remote so your news field doesn't filter out but there is a problem is there a solution to it i don't think there is a solution to it the way conventionally we think uh okay unless someone goes and mediates and get does thing because they have not responded to asean in which they are a member they have not responded to chinese overtures they have not responded to our overtures yeah china has they have uh, continued trade with china china has said okay Ch- the chinese pragmatism said we'll do trade with whoever is in power and china is actively vying for the cmec that is the china myanmar economic corridor and china wants that port at kyakfu uh the military janta says oh we'll give you but i don't think they'll give i mean that's the way they've been handling it so far it's not so simple in all this i think last month our foreign secretary went to myanmar must have had a talk how to you know sort out equations the immediately the next month within a few days the chinese uh, representative was there in myanmar that this ding dong battle will go on but what we have to understand and what we have to tell quad and what we have to tell usa is myanmar needs a quad approach myanmar is the country which connects indo and the pacific on one side it has a pacific and on one side it has the indian oceans okay i mean when i say the thing it's not exactly the pacific ocean but just a the little region, sliver yeah. of thailand and yeah it's there okay and the connect and myanmar is the shortest route for china into the indian ocean and the bay of bengal through the kyakfu port and the cmec so stabilizing myanmar is in the interests of india and in the as part of the larger indo pacific construct this is something which i don't see coming out in the indo pacific dialogues everyone talks of side china sea while south china sea is important this is very important also right open out another front so, as a matter of fact i will not yeah it opens out another front in the containment of china yeah but the fact is that are we alive to that in if that if we are alive to that will sanctions alone sort out the issue or is there a diplomatic outreach required by quad as a whole with india in the forefront so these are the issues which have to be factored in it's a very very good suggestion so i think uh, it's not been spoken about i hope somebody hears it and gives it a shot even for for our own neighborhood uh, you know generally we've discussed four countries uh, uh, sri lanka pakistan nepal and myanmar 
Now, one of the biggest things that is there is an ethnic connect between India and uh, each one of these countries, which is individual to that particular country. Um, Pakistan, of course, is a you know a strict no-no that way. But uh, the rest of the three have a huge ethnic contact between the populations between both the countries. Uh, I'm not saying let's use that, but there is a use for that entire ethnic connect. And how do you see that moving on? And your concluding thoughts about this particular factor, sir? Yeah, this is important. This is something we have underplayed and underutilized. Mm. The ethnic connect and the religious connect is something which we need to build on. I'm not talking of uh, religious polarization and all. See, no, no, no. Most of these countries are Buddhist. Yeah. Sri Lanka uh, and uh, Myanmar. Myanmar. Right, Buddhist. And here you have, you are the seat of Buddhism. How do you use this Buddhism in a positive manner to build better relations? Can you talk of uh, ethno religious uh, religious tourism and development of ties, study centers, like the Confucius centers which they have set up all over? So those things are on the cards. With Nepal, Nepal is the only Hindu kingdom in the world. So can we? You know, progress that. And also, Nepal has got a Buddhist connect. Right? So, can we use it? So, this is something we need to look at. Right? And I will not talk of the Muslim links at, as of now. Okay? But these two religions are something which we must utilize uh, in a positive manner to develop our cultural equations. And this is part of our culture also. This is our own culture. It is our own ethos. So, right, so this is something which we have to do. Then, of course, India needs a stable uh, neighborhood. Unless we have a stable neighborhood, we can't progress. These countries are in a problem, there's no doubt. We have to out, uh, do an outreach to them and take them along. We can't say that India is rising and these people are falling or alienated. Take them along. Unless they are part of the progress of India, we'll not will still be hamstrung by that string of pearls uh, thinking and they have these people have to start looking towards us this is the time for us to rebuild trade ties with them which have been severed right they have to start looking towards us for everything whether it's communication whether it's fuel whether it's everything right uh, trade ultimately trade counts so this is something which we have to really think of uh, because there are opportunities we shouldn't let them go right it's in the neighborhoods uh, progress and stability that india's uh, uh, own stability and rise uh, will depend upon uh, these are my final thoughts no as a matter of fact uh, i agree with you sir if ethnicity can actually join two countries it can also divide two countries it can also create localized problems within india uh, within that ethnic community, uh, probably neighboring that that particular country in question, and you know that's one of the reasons. And uh, this is you know we we've done a, another crisis sort of an episode where we talked about India's arms on fire with Pakistan in a bit of a economic yeah, crisis said, at that time. Correct, wings on fire. Yes, sir, and wings on fire. And Myanmar at that time the the coup had just happened, and today we also have the feet, you know, lighting up on fire and yeah, thank you, China. <laughs> Uh, there's there's been a lot of chaos. Uh, I believe we have woken up, but I think uh, uh, the giant sleeping giant needs to wake up and start walking because there's there's a lot of ground to be covered within this entire neighborhood. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for taking me through you know a journey of India's neighborhood, Chinese hands within the entire region, how they have uh, brought about a change within those countries and the specifics that they find themselves at today. Till next time, sir, for another session, another subject. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Thank you.